On April 30th last year, 2022, the NFL football draft, Brock Purdy, a 22-year-old quarterback from Iowa State, was chosen by the San Francisco 49ers as the 262nd draft pick. Uh, it's the very last pick of the draft, which is, it's playfully, but kind of publicly referred to as Mr. Irrelevant. Um, seriously, it's, that's what he's called. Uh, many of you may not know much about football, but everyone knows what it's like to be the very last pick um, for, a, for a game, for a team. Nobody likes to be that person. Um, and when it comes to the NFL, which only allows about 53 players on each team's roster, those players um, who get picked late in the NFL draft, they usually just get cut from um, the team in practice before the season even starts. However, Purdy proved to be a hard worker. He was kept on the roster, and in first 13 weeks of the NFL season, <clears throat> both the first and the second string quarterbacks, um, they suffered season-ending injuries, and the 49ers looked to Mr. Irrelevant, uh, Brock Purdy, to step up and take the lead. And so he, sh he shocked the football world. He led the 49ers to seven straight wins, taking them to the NFC Conference Championship last Sunday. Um, against the Eagles. Unfortunately, he ended up getting hurt. He got injured like the sixth, sixth play of the first drive. And so um, that Cinderella run was kind of ended. Otherwise, he, he might have played in the Super Bowl next Sunday. Who, who doesn't love an underdog story? Um, you know, the unlikely hero, the person that shocks everyone when they step up and do what needs to be done. Have you ever kind of secretly wished you could be that person? Maybe you feel like you're, you're, you're a pretty ordinary person, but you'd, you want to do extraordinary things. Most of the world today operates in this kind of uh, like cream rises to the top uh, sort of way. The smartest intellects, the strongest bodies, the fastest athletes, most creative minds, most beautiful people. They're the ones that seem to be chosen. Uh, there are exceptions to this, but you know, most college applications or job interviews, um, they're designed to find the very best, the very brightest, right? I think perhaps one of the most shocking things that we discover when we read the Bible is that God seems to turn this on its head. He often chooses the weak things of the world for his purposes. He resists the proud. He lifts up the humble. You could almost say that God picks those who the world considers irrelevant. Listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 1. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to know nothing things that are, so that no human being may, might boast in the presence of God. How did he do this, you might ask? Verse 30, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom of God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let one who boasts, boast in the Lord. God often chooses to use people who the world considers irrelevant. He chooses the foolish, the weak, the low, the despised. Have you found yourself in that category before? You're not the smartest, you're not the strongest. You may not even feel very valuable. Maybe for you, it's the, it's the very opposite. So you're, you, you're the one that boasts in your strength and your intellect. You even look down on others as inferior. Maybe you don't say that outwardly, but you think it. Today, we're gonna to talk about what type of people Jesus calls to be his special messengers of his good news. And it's shocking. He chooses ordinary men as messengers of the king to spread the good news of the kingdom. In our series through the book of Matthew, we finished up the end of uh, chapter 9 where Jesus, he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He sees the crowd as, as a plentiful harvest, tells his followers to pray that God would send labors into the harvest fields. And then, Jesus calls 12 of his disciples. Those that were praying for laborers are now sent out as laborers into the harvest field. Our passage today is Matthew 10, 1 to 4. Uh, it's one of the four places in the Bible where we have 
um, we're, we're actually listed, it has a list of Jesus' 12 disciples that were sent out. Um, and I'd like to take to di- time today to consider each one of them, um, what they can teach us about what kind of person God chooses as his messengers. Now, some of you are turning to the passage. Before you open that passage, I want to just try something right here. I'd like you to take, um, just pause and, um, and, and take the next 60 seconds. Just turn to the person next to you and see if you guys can come up with those 12 disciples right on, on that list. Okay, so next 60 seconds, um, turn to the person next to you. You guys collaborate right down on that front of your handout, all 12 disciples. Ready, go. All right, it's close to 60 seconds. Go ahead and put your pen down. Um, I don't have a prize for you. Um, how many of you, though, that think you got all 12 down there? Got a good number of you? No, there's no, a couple people. Okay. I asked a few people this question this past week, and no one was able to list all 12 without some help. And I think part of that is because some of the apostles aren't really mentioned <clears throat> much other than in the four lists. Um, that we have here in the Bible. And like, like half of them are multiple names. You have to kind of distinguish between two with the same name. So I get that that's, that's tricky. Um, my sermon is going to be a little bit different today. Um, but since this is, this is one of the times in the Bible where it lists all of the apostles all in one place, what I'd like to do is kind of a quick character sketch on each disciple by looking at different parts of the gospels where they show up. And then kind of step back and consider what we can learn about the type of people that God chooses to use. I realize we could spend an entire sermon on some of, you know, just single characters, one of the apostles or multiple. Um, Some people have done that in the past, and that is great. There's some great resources out there. Um, My purpose today, though, is to communicate the force of the passage here in Matthew, which lists all 12 men without focusing on just one. And before we actually start through the list of names, let's just look down at Matthew 10, 1, and consider the the nature of Jesus' selection. Uh, Matthew gives us this introductory summary of what is Jesus sending them out to do, which he'll pick up again, and he'll explain in detail for the rest of the chapter. Let's go ahead and read the passage together. Um, Actually, I'm going to start back in in Matthew 9, verse 32, to kind of get a running start and see how how Matthew is piecing together these... um, these different elements to to lead us to this section about the apostles. Matthew 9, starting in verse 32. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. As you can see, Jesus' message about the gospel of the kingdom, it it does not have to do with with political overthrow of the Roman occupation there in Israel. Uh, Jesus is demonstrating that he's the Messiah who has authority over 
unclean spirits, over demons, over Satan's forces. And we're going to continue to see references to demons and unclean spirits throughout Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Matthew because Jesus' arrival as the king introduces the clashing of two kingdoms, kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. So Jesus is kind of less concerned about the Romans and their political control. In fact, he's, he's, almost somewhat, he's almost dismissive of their control. When talking to Pilate before his death, Pilate claims to have authority to kill him. What does Jesus say? He says, you, you would have no authority over me unless, at all unless it had been given you from above. Jesus identifies people's greatest need not as freedom from an earthly authoritarian regime, but freedom from captivity to the prince of the power of darkness. So Jesus came to rescue people from sin and from Satan, and he sends his messengers out to spread his good news. Matthew 10, 1 bears this out. He called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. Jesus demonstrated for his he demonstrated this for his disciples, right? We read about that in the past few chapters. And now he's, he's having his disciples carry on this ministry to prove that Jesus has all authority. He has authority to cast out demons, the authority to heal the sick, the authority to forgive sin. Jesus sends out 12 men to continue his work in the surrounding villages, to rescue helpless sheep, to reap the harvest, to spread the good news of the gospel as messengers of the king. So, what type of people did King Jesus select as his apostles? Which I will not go into detail. I'll go into detail later in future times when I speak through this chapter. But apostles here have a special represent, a special uh, place, a special role. We see that later in the New Testament as the foundation for the early church. Um, but it's sent ones. And so we continue um, to, uh, to, to be not original apostles, but sent ones, sent messengers into a lost world. What type of people did Jesus select as his messengers? He gives us a list in verse two to four. Let's just go ahead and read the list, and then we'll just talk through each apostle, each um, special messenger of Christ. So verse two, I I stopped right there um, with... um, with Simon. Names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. We're going to d- divide this list into three groups of four, um, since that's what the, um, what the four Bible lists do. Um, as you can he- see on the screen, I have a, a screen up there. That, uh, I think it'll help it help you uh, visualize that. Can we get that up there? It's a couple slides. There's First Corinthians. One more. There we go. Can you even see that? Or is that really difficult? So that shows you the four lists um, in the Bible where all of them are, are, are listed, all the apostles. Hopefully this will make it a little bit easier for you to remember. Um, you can see on the graphic, um, it, the lists differ slightly. Um, but Peter, Philip, and James, the son of Alphaeus, maintain their place in each list as the start of each group of four. Go ahead and go through those, and you can see how those are, um, those are divided up. So let's just begin. We'll begin with this first group of four, Peter. Peter shows up first in each list of the disciples, um, which is significant. Um, in fact, when Matthew says, first, Simon, who's called Peter, in verse 2, he's, he's not implying that Peter was the first to be called as a disciple. He wasn't. That was his brother, Andrew, probably John as well. Um, but the idea is that Peter is the, the foremost. He, he's the, the first among equals. You could write that down next to Peter. He's the first among equals. Peter was a leader among the disciples. Um, however, sometimes he was impetuous. He was impulsive in his leadership. In Matthew 16, it's Peter who is quick to speak up, to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And yet it's also Peter who gets rebuked for trying to correct Jesus after he prophesies, Jesus prophesies his coming death. And Jesus says, no. In Matthew 26, it's Peter who speaks up. He claims that he will never abandon Jesus and all the disciples agree. John 6, Peter speaks on behalf of the disciples, says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And yet 
It's also Peter who denies that he knows Jesus three times on the night of Jesus' betrayal. His name is, uh, was Simon. Jesus gave him the, the surname uh, Cephas in Aramaic or Peter in Greek. Both mean uh, rock or stone. It might seem kind of ironic since Peter, um, he caved. He denied Jesus, but as we'll talk about later, in the strength of the spirit in the book of Acts, Peter was solid. He was, he was resolute, strong leader in the early church. Peter was a fisherman by trade, as were the first four on our list. Um, he was originally from the town of Bethsaida, but the story of Jesus um, healing his mother-in-law in Capernaum uh, reveals that he was married. He did have a house. You know, there's so much more we could talk about, uh, we could say about Peter, especially since he's so prominent. He's so uh, verbal. Um, He's so out front in the gospel accounts. Uh, we could take a whole sermon, really, but my goal is to give just a brief overview, portrait of the 12 disciples. So let's move on to Peter's brother, Andrew. Andrew um, was actually one of the first disciples, uh, among, um, along with John, to begin following Jesus, and, and one of those to actually acknowledge that, um, that Jesus was the Messiah. Um, he, he kind of took a back seat, though, to his brother, Peter, who was louder and perhaps older, uh, Andrew never really promotes himself. What he's best known for is bringing people to Jesus. You might write that down next to Andrew. Andrew bringing people to Jesus. Most significantly, he brought his brother, Peter. Um, but he also brought uh, the boy um, with five loaves and two fish in John 6. He brought a group of Greeks to Jesus that were in Jerusalem in John 12. Andrew can, he can barely get a word in edgewise when his brother is around. Maybe some of you can relate with that. Uh, but we get the picture that Andrew, he's, he's okay. He's, he's with that. He's, he's humble. He's a servant that's just faithfully following Jesus as his disciple, bringing others to Jesus. Andrew is also a fisherman, along with his brother Peter. Um, but they weren't the only brothers. They weren't the only fishermen among the disciples. That brings us to, to James and John, son of Zebedee. There's a few different James in the Bible, um, so it can be a little bit confusing. Um, this is, um, in fact, there was another one in the list of the 12 disciples. It's a fairly common name in that culture. Like with Simon Peter, uh, Jesus also gives James and his brother John a nickname. Their combined nickname is uh, Boanerges, Boanerges, which is Aramaic. It's a, this is the language that Jesus spoke along with Hebrew. Um, and it, the, the, the nickname just means sons of thunder. I think you can get the idea of what that meant. Uh, probably indicates that James and his brother were, um, they're passionate, they're zealous. Uh, these are fishermen with a fiery personality. In Luke 9, after Jesus is rejected by this Samaritan village on his way to Jerusalem, the sons of thunder, they respond, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? And James and his brother have this fiery zeal. You might want to write that down next to James, fiery zeal. And so John, he, uh, Jesus, he chooses, he chooses a rock, the rock, Peter, and sons of thunder, um, the Boanerges brothers, to be his closest companions. They represent this inner circle, if you will. Three guys that, that go with Jesus um, in these special, um, these key moments in his ministry, um, his transfiguration, where they witnessed the physical manifestation of Jesus' heavenly glory, or G Garden of the Gethsemane, when Jesus agonized in prayer before his betrayal. Herod must have known that James was, he was important. He was an important leader there among the 12 um, in the early church, because he's the first disciple to be martyred. He's the only disciple whose death is recorded in the Bible. In contrast to this, his brother John is the one disciple who lived the longest. So I'm moves, moves us on to the next, um, the fourth in this first set of four. John, um, like Andrew, was probably a little brother, kind of quietly walked in the shadow of his older brother, and yet John is, John is out front when it comes to following Christ in Mark 1, or being the first to run to the tomb when he heard that Christ had risen. John 20, or being the first to recognize Jesus from the boat when Jesus came and he spoke to them from the shore after his resurrection. Jesus is first he, he, because he knows Jesus. He, he loves Jesus. He's described as the disciple whom Jesus loved. You might write that down next to John, the disciple, the beloved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Don't misunderstand. John, John was strong. Remember, he's a fisherman. He's not a wimp. 
He's a son of thunder, but he's a man who, who loved God and was loved by God. He went on to write much about love in his three epistles. He's also probably the writer of Gospel of John and the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Before we continue to the next set of four disciples, can you just take a moment to consider what kind of people Jesus calls to be his messengers? What can you learn from those four people? We see leadership potential as well as like misplaced zeal. Four fishermen who would hardly be your first choice when selecting leaders who would form and lead the early church, and yet that's exactly who Jesus chooses. Philip begins our second group of four disciples, men we know even less about. Sometimes Philip is confused with Philip in Acts chapter 6, who was appointed as a deacon who served as an evangelist. Um, this apostle, Philip, was from Bethsaida, like Peter and Andrew. Peter is, uh, Philip is, is similar to Andrew in that he, he brings other people to Jesus. Um, in John 1, right after Jesus calls Philip, what does Philip do? He goes on and he finds his um, friend Nathaniel and says to him, We have found him who Moses um, in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip knew that the law, he knew the law and the prophets. He knew his Bible um, and he knew what he was looking at when he saw Jesus. Philip is mentioned in John 6 when Jesus tests Philip and asks him where they're going to buy enough food for the 5,000 people there. Um, in John 12, some Greeks come to Philip because they want to see Jesus and Philip confers with Andrew before taking them to Jesus. And then finally in John 14, we have another reference to Philip where he asked Jesus to show them, the show them, the disciples, God the Father. And Jesus replies, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. Philip uh, is impacted by what he sees, right? So uh, when he met Jesus, he calls Nathaniel. He says, come and see, come and see this one. Philip is overwhelmed by the financial need when he sees those crowds that are hungry. Philip asks Jesus to let him see the Father. It's kind of a theme. A lot of the disciples get caught up with what they see and fail to have faith, which is believing that which you don't see. Bartholomew is next in our list. Um, Bartholomew means son of Ptolemy. You know, many scholars consider um, Nathaniel, mentioned only in the Gospel of John, and Bartholomew uh, from the other Gospels. It's kind of the same person, so you could write down there Bartholomew and write next to him Nathaniel. Um, they, they see them as the same person for a couple of reasons. Um, one, he's associated with the 12 disciples, um, John 1 and, and John 21. Um, also, when Philip, Philip is the one who brings Nathaniel to Jesus, and Philip and Bartholomew are always next to each other in the lists. Um, in John 1, we learn that Nathaniel is a man with a measure of skepticism, but he's an honest man. Philip invites Nathaniel to come meet Jesus of Nazareth. And what is Nathaniel's reply? He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Um, but after meeting Jesus and learning that Jesus already saw, knew him, an Israelite indeed in whom there's no deceit, and he had saw, seen him already sitting under the fig tree, he confesses, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Thomas is the next person on our list, and he gets kind of a bad rap. Um, Thomas is known by many to epitomize um, skepticism, cynicism. Uh, he shows up three times in the Gospel of John. Each time, he seems kind of cynical. In John 11, Jesus announces that um, they're going to go to Bethany, where Lazarus has died, um, and Thomas responds, let us all go, that we may die with him. In John 14, he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? In John 20, Thomas asserts that he'll never believe that he'll never believe what the other disciples claim that they've um, that they've seen Jesus risen from the dead unless he personally sees Christ and touches his wounds. Thomas certainly had some some doubt issues, um, which we could probably relate with if we're honest. But at the same time, we sh we should admire his desire to be with Jesus. And just look again. He says, "Let us go and die." with him. He says to Jesus, you know, where are you going? How can we know the way? He says, I, I, I want to see and touch Christ personally. Each statement captures his, his weak faith, but it's also his desire to just be with Jesus. 
And when Jesus did appear, he confessed, my Lord, my God. The last in our, that second set would be Matthew. Matthew or Levi, which is his Hebrew name, which you can write next to, next to Matthew, um, is next in our list. You know, in Matthew 10, he identifies himself as Matthew the tax collector. I preached back in September about how Jesus came to call sinners um, to follow him. And when it comes to a Jew's estimation of a really bad person, a sinner, um, tax collectors fit the bill. They're hated. They were despised as traitors who worked for the Romans and financially took advantage of their own people, the Jews. They're thieves. They were traitors. They were social outcasts. And yet Jesus called him to follow. Matthew responds by inviting Jesus to his house along with his sinful friends to eat together. I think this has to be one of the most shocking inclusions to this list of disciples. Matthew. It's one thing to rescue a lost sheep, sinner who's far from the fold, but to choose him as one of your special messengers is completely different. A king might pardon a notorious criminal who's demonstrated you know, repentance, he's, he's turned from his ways, but, but he'll not place him in a leadership position in his court or, or send him as a trusted emissary, an ambassador, representing his kingdom. And that is exactly what Jesus does with Matthew. That's what he does with us. And we pause once again after another four disciples ask the question, what kind of people does Jesus call as his chosen disciples? It's kind of a mixed bag, right? And you've got Nathaniel, who's an Israelite indeed, in whom there's no deceit. And then you have Matthew, who's lived a life of deception, defrauding people of their money as a tax collector. And we have men who claim that Jesus is the Son of God, the King of Israel. And we have others that have real serious questions about God's plan, his provision. There seem to be a lot of potential mixed with a lot of doubt, a lot of skepticism. That sound familiar? This is who Jesus chooses. One theologian says, if the faults and the character flaws of the apostles seem like a mirror of your own weakness, take heart. These are the kinds of people the Lord delights to use. The last four disciples, we'll just go through really quickly here because we know almost nothing about them. James is listed as the son of Alphaeus, really just to distinguish him from James, the brother of um, James and his brother John, the son of, son of Zebedee. Uh, we don't know else at all about James. Thaddeus um, is probably the same as, as Judas of James, not Judas Iscariot. The only mention of Judas, um, this Judas, this Thaddeus, is in John 14. He asks uh, kind of a general question, and he's expressly differentiated from the other Judas. Um, we have Simon, um, well, so, so we have two James, we have two Judases, and now we have two Simons. The Simons are distinguished, um, uh, this one by being a, a zealot. It says Simon the Zealot, which refers to his previous connection with um, this sect of Jewish radicals that thought to o they, they sought to overthrow Roman rule. They're kind of like, um, uh, you know, terrorists. <laughs> uh, they're extreme nationalists, and Jesus called him and completely changed his priorities. And then we have finally Judas. Judas is always found at the last, uh, last place in all the lists. And Matthew describes him as the one who, quote, betrayed Jesus. The term Iscariot probably refers to his occupation or where, uh, where he lived, village that he was from. We know from John 12 that Judas managed the finances for the disciples. He was dishonest, kind of taking off part of the money for himself. So there you have it, the 12 disciples, 12 apostles. We made it through the list. How many of you have ever been to a cathedral with stained glass windows that are venerating the apostles? Have you seen this? Have any of you been to this? What do they have around their heads? Halos. God used these men as foundations for the church, and yet sometimes we can forget that many of them had, had serious character flaws and shortcomings. Can I just read off a list? Eight, eight ways in which Jesus' 12 apostles are described in the Gospels. Number one, they're ignorant. 
Matthew 15, Jesus gives this parable to the Pharisees about defilement. And Peter asked Jesus afterwards to explain the parable. And Jesus is like, are you still without understanding? He says something similar to that in Mark 8. When Jesus is talking about leaven, you know, the false doctrine of the Pharisees. And his disciples are like, yeah, he's, think that he's talking about actual bread, the fact that they didn't have any bread. And Jesus is like, why are you talking about not having bread? Do you still not see? You still don't understand? Their spiritual understanding was lacking. They're ignorant. Number two, they're doubtful. We already talked about Thomas. They're doubting. But Jesus also says four different times, oh, you of little faith. Then you have Peter who doubted while he's walking on the water. While he's walking on the water, he's doubtful. Ignorant, doubting. They're fearful. And they, they, they fled from Jesus. Um, fled when, when Jesus was betrayed. In his greatest hour of, of need, you know, they abandoned him. Peter denies Jesus at Christ's trial. They're fearful. They're self-absorbed. Remember the conversation in Mark 9 and Luke 9? The disciples are arguing among themselves about who's the greatest. They're self-absorbed. They're impetuous. Peter is top of that list. He corrects Jesus when he says he's going to die. Um, Jesus is, says he's going to die in Matthew 16. In John 13, Peter refuses to let Jesus wash his feet. They're impetuous. They're prejudiced. You know, Nathaniel was that skeptical one. We heard about Jesus from Nazareth being the Messiah. Um, says, how could that be? A Nazarene. They're presumptuous. The John and James come to Jesus along with their mother and Matthew in Matthew 20. They say, I think, I think we'd like to have a seat there next to you in your kingdom. And finally, they're, they're merciless. You have those same brothers who are going to call down fire from heaven to destroy this village. What a great evangelism mindset, right? So why do they end up in stained glass windows? Why do we name our kids after some of them and read books that they helped write there in the New Testament? Because their usefulness as messengers of the king is not determined by their sin or their past, but by the Savior who can teach, who can train, who can transform his disciples to be more like him. And not only that, but in the book of Acts at Pentecost, Jesus put his Holy Spirit inside each of those men, minus Judas. And their story completely changed after that. Jesus took Peter, a rough rock, sharp edges, and he shaped him into a pillar of the early church. Whereas he denied Jesus three times in one morning before the crucifixion, after Jesus' resurrection, Peter boldly preached about Christ to thousands of people. Jesus took James and John, these two fiery sons of thunder. He forges them into wise and courageous leaders in the early church. Jesus takes this group of 12 ignorant, spiritually immature followers of Jesus, and he uses them to teach doctrine, to guide the early church with letters written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus takes this group of fearful men and uses them to turn the world upside down. They courageously preach the gospel, taught everything that Christ commanded even though it cost most of them their lives. You know, early Christian writers record them suffering horrific deaths, some of which include being crucified, beheaded, burned, stoned, boiled, speared, sawn in two. And I realize some of those accounts may be kind of legendary, but their courage was not. They had courage because they had seen their resurrected Savior, and they were given the Holy Spirit. And the same is true of you. If you have come to see Jesus in his death and his resurrection, if you've repented and you've believed the good news that Jesus took your sin on the cross, then rose to give new life, you've received the Spirit. And you can have courage sharing the gospel with others as a messenger of the King because he has promised to be with you. The Holy Spirit is in you. As we come to the conclusion today, I just want to make a few closing applications um, from what we've learned about these 12 disciples that Jesus sent out. Number one, Jesus chooses messengers from all types. All types of different people. Uh, being being a, a messenger of the king to share the gospel of the kingdom is not based on, um, first of all, it's not based on your age. 
How many of you are like, you know, under 15 here or under 16? Okay, we got a couple that are here today. So the disciples were probably really young. If Jesus is around 30, the disciples are often younger than the rabbi. Um, in the Jewish culture, a young man's discipleship training under the rabbi usually began around ages 13 to 15. Okay, these are young guys. The disciples, it also continues. You know, some of these disciples continued proclaiming Christ. A lot of them died early. <clears throat> we have John, who's continued to be faithful until late in life. Being a messenger of the king isn't restricted, isn't based on your age. We have all ages represented here, right, Rafe? <laughs> and all in between. Age is not an excuse. It's not based on your family situation. So we have singles, single men there that are, that are going out and sharing the gospel. We also have Peter, who's married. And then you have even siblings that are working together. Um, it's not based on your family situation, your age, your occupation, your personality. I mean, literally, we have fishermen that, like, you know, work with their hands. And then you have a tax collector who's, like, using his mind, you know, desk job. This was not a group of young men from the local speech and debate club. Uh, Jesus is not looking for a certain personality or list of qualifications. Uh, he does gift certain people's evangelists, but he, he sends all out as messengers. He sends each one of us. Education is not a prerequisite. I mean, Acts 4 verse 13, it says when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived they were uneducated, common men. They were astonished. They recognize that they had been with Jesus. That is your education. They had been with Jesus. The fact that they were uneducated probably meant they, they hadn't pursued a higher Jewish education. Education is certainly not a disadvantage um, for messengers of king, but it's not a requirement. What about financial status? You know, we don't know much about their finances other than the fact that Peter and Matthew owned houses. Um, you know, when Jesus called James and John to follow him in Mark 1, it says that they left their boat, their nets, and their father, along with the hired servants. So they probably had a family business there. They probably did pretty well. Um, but in the end, financial status didn't factor into their usefulness as messengers of the king because they had to leave it all behind anyway. What about history? Your past. Does that determine your usefulness as a messenger of the king? Absolutely not. Matthew and Simon give you a sample of the extreme backgrounds that are represented. Matthew over here is friendly with the Romans, hated by the Jews. He's regarded as a traitor. And Simon, the zealot, is hated by the Romans, defended the Jewish nation, regarded as a radical patriot. However, when they come to Christ, their lives are completely changed. In some ways, their background is, is it's inconsequential. It doesn't matter what you've done or what you haven't done, because it's not about you. You're simply a messenger of the king when you share the gospel with others. Jesus chooses messengers from all types. Secondly, Jesus calls us in before sending us out. He calls us in before sending us out. Matthew 10, 1 begins with the words, and he called to him his 12 disciples. I've met people before um, who are sharing the gospel but failing to walk worthy of the gospel. They talk about Christ with others without walking closely with Christ. If I can just say, the best way for you to prepare to share Christ with others is to draw close to Christ yourself. Jesus calls us in and gives us words of life before sending us out to a lost and dying world. Jesus calls us in before sending us out. Number three, Jesus authorizes those he sends out. Matthew 10 says that Jesus gave them authority. After demonstrating his authority over sickness and sin and nature and demons, he sends his disciples out and authorizes their mission. And the same is true today. Matthew 28, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's number four. Jesus authorizes those who sends out. 
He has authority and he gives you that. But number four, Jesus doesn't send us out alone. Jesus doesn't send us out alone. There's two ways you could take this. The disciples were not sent out alone. They were sent in pairs. I think that's valuable practice. But even more than that, as Matthew 28 indicates, since we have the Holy Spirit within us, he is with us when we go out as messengers of the king. If you're sitting here today and you're a believer, but you've kind of been sitting on the sidelines when it comes to carrying the message of salvation to a lost and dying world, let me remind you that Jesus doesn't have a 53-man roster. (laughs) There's no irrelevant players when it comes to evangelism. Jesus has commanded us to pray for laborers in the harvest field. And then he sent us out to be those labors. He is calling you in to himself in order to send you out. He wants you, he wants me to be an ambassador, an emissary, a a messenger with the good news that Jesus died for our sins. He reigns as our living king. That's incredible. 2 Corinthians 5 says, All this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. What a privilege! What a responsibility. What a need. We, we, we need to pray. We need God's equipping. Um, can you just bow your head right now and consider what God has done in your own heart through the gospel? I think of how he's transformed your life your relationship with sin and with your siblings and with your spouse. He's changed our lives, the way that we, that we think about life, the way that we live. He's given us hope in the midst of suffering. There are people around us every single day who do not have that worldview. They don't have that hope because they don't have the Savior. Does that bother you? God, I pray that you will continue to, you, you've been working in my heart um, these last few months especially, and I thank you for that, exposing my, my fear and my tendency to dismiss um, the Holy Spirit's conviction about sharing the greatest news the world has ever heard with those that are lost and on their way to hell. Father, continue to, to press in to my heart and press us in to you so that we can be sent out to make known the unsearchable riches of Christ. Father, thank you for the fact that you, you know, choose to use weak vessels. I'm one of those. Um, if we come to the place where we, we don't recognize that we're, that we're needy, would you um, bring us to a place of humility so that we could acknowledge that? God, we need you. And everything, but especially here with sharing the gospel, um, we can be fearful, not know what what to say, but um, you have the words of life. It's not what we have to say, it's what you have said. So Father, um, use us as your ambassadors in this city and in Southern California, in our own homes and businesses, for the glory of Christ for the advance of the kingdom 
for we love you and we pray through Christ. Amen.